again, everybody. You're all welcome back. Um, we're doing very well on time. We're about four minutes ahead, um, which is really good in terms of getting you out at the end of the evening at the proper time. We now have two separate presentations um, from the rep and from the best practice development team. Um, two separate presentations because there aren't enough seats up here to hold everybody. I don't know what we're going to do next year when there'll be even more people um, as part of the combined team. So first we have a presentation from the rep team in the School of Law in UL. Owen, Caitlin and Jackie will present on the findings from the three-year action research project on relationships. Um, I may have said there were 14 YDPs earlier, 16 is the correct figure. Um, and these were the case study sites from around the state. The presentation focuses on the findings from the three stages of the research. That would be followed by a presentation by the best practice development team about their role, connection to the strategy, practice developments, and how this links into the work that, that you do on the front line. Um, best practice development team was established in 2015, um, and there are currently four members. Sinead, Neve, Lorna, and Adele. They'll speak about their role, that connection to the strategy, and so on. Um, three veterans and one new person since the last time we met, so a particular warm welcome uh, to Sinead, who has recently joined the Best Practice Development Team. I'm now handing over to uh, Owen and his colleagues. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? The mics are good. The longest room I've ever seen in my life, so please bear with me. Um, as you can see here, we just pulled out some clips from our online work that we would have done with the group of 16 projects. So uh, sorry to those in the audience that can see yourselves, you can even see your names, so apologies about that. Probably should have asked you in advance. Um, but yeah, it's a lot easier to do when you can see silly hats on people rather than up here in person. Um, so today I'm going to present with my colleagues, Caitlin Lewis and Jackie Duan on the Relationships Project, which has been referred to as the Action Research Project as well. Um, the Action Research part of this is over now, so it's kind of a wider piece that we're going to kind of talk to you about as well. We're mainly going to focus on our findings today, um, and it's specifically what we're going to focus on, how can relationships affect change in young people's offending behaviour, which is really, really important. So just to kind of... Um, uh, give myself a bit of a break here. What we're trying to do is give you about three years of work in about 15 minutes. So please just bear with us on that. It's quite complicated to put it down into such a short kind of amount of time. Um, but this overview is, is kind of what we're going to cover. So I'm going to start with what the Relationships Project was about, what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the findings from our research on how relationships with youth justice workers affect young people. Uh, my colleague Caitlin is going to talk about the co-design guidance on how to build relationships that divert young people from crime. And then Jackie's gonna speak about the findings from our, our related implementation study, which is a core part of the work as well. Um, and just on the left-hand side here, just to point out that this is the kind of list of projects that was involved with us over the three years for the action research. Um, a lot of you guys are down there. I was gonna get you to stand up, but I've embarrassed you enough already with the pictures. Um, so I won't ask you to do that. But what I will ask people to do is this work wouldn't be possible without these 16 projects helping us for three years, been involved with us, been in, in, in part of this, this process, which was really, really complicated with COVID at times. So can I, can I ask people to give them a round of applause? And you know who you are. Yeah. That's a round of applause at Crow Park is always a good thing. Um, so just um, to, to move forward. So why relationships and why action research? Really, really importantly, we estimate that about 60% of your time is spent on building relationships with young people. So it's a really, really important policy area. You're not doing these relationships for the sake of it. You're doing these relationships to divert young people away from crime and antisocial behavior. So it's really, really important we understand how they work and what they look like. So that was our mission. And as you can see, our picture there was one of the sessions we would have had with a group of about 50 um, people that were involved in this all together that kind of worked through how we were going to do this process together over the few years. So it was really, really core that those 16 projects were involved with us in a co-design process for the few years. Really, really important. Um, and why action research then? As you can see, action research is a flexible research process that allows you to look at a program while it has been carried out 
and adapt accordingly rather than at the end. So most evaluations happen at the end of a program. With action research, you can change things as you go. You can test and trial things and move forward that knowledge onto the next level. So really, really important. And we set out to answer three specific questions related to how we're going to cover our presentation today. Uh, how do relationships with youth justice workers affect young people? And we did that by talking to young people or getting youth justice workers to speak to the young people and collect that data. Second one is how can youth justice workers build relationships that divert young people um, from crime? And that's the how to do these relationships. Sounds a bit you know, like it's a manual, but it's not. It's, it's very different than that. It's very much around what people told us was very good practice around how they build relationships with young people. And then Caitlin's gonna present on that piece. And then um, how can youth justice workers be supported to implement the effective relationship work that we would have figured out together? So really important, a part of this is around kind of the implementation. So. Um, yeah, Jackie's gonna, gonna go there. So really briefly, so the answer to the first question, how do relationships with youth justice workers affect young people? Really briefly tell you about the methods, only, only a minute. Um, we supported youth justice workers and helped them to collect the data from the young people. That resulted in about 27 young people um, being spoken to, we call them conversations, there was interviews, there was focus groups, um, from about 11 of the 16 sites, there was no pressure on people, it was during COVID, so it was quite difficult. Um, there were slightly more females, but pretty much an even mix, about 52% female, um, and mostly current YDP members. Some obviously we would have asked people to you know, go if, if past or present, it didn't matter as long as they're, you, they, they were referred to YDPs. So what we found really importantly is young people reported to the youth justice workers who then reported to us that they felt these relationships that they built with their youth justice workers made them more trusting. They became more trusting, not just to their peers, but to those in authority, which is really important if you're thinking about crime diversion. Young people would have reported having an increased optimism and possibility. So they began to see things in the future. And the cable project a while ago, someone said, that I, I know what I want to do in the future. I want to focus on my future. That, that stuff is really, really important. And that's what young people would have, would have told you justice workers. Um, better at navigating their own relationships. So being able to form bonds became a really, really important part of that. Bonds with peers, bonds with having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And being able to do that was really, really important. Having improved coping skills, and I think things around anger came up here, where people were able to control their anger a bit more. Improved decision making and maturity, again, are, are around you know, making this decision to various parts in their lives and feeling like they were able to, to come up with the consequences of their actions. Um, improved self-worth and confidence then was around people's positive self-image or becoming more, more positive around themselves as they, they develop that relationship with the youth justice worker. So I'm going to hand you over because I'm going slightly over here um, to Caitlin who's going to talk you through um, the next part. Our report as well, which has more detail than this, will be coming out in the coming months um, and there's a lot more detail than what I presented. Thanks. Caitlin. Thanks, Owen. Hi, everybody. Hey, great. So I'm gonna talk you through the methods and the findings for our second research question, which was how can youth justice workers build relationships that divert young people from crime? Just to briefly go through the method of how we did this part of the research. First, we did 24 interviews with youth justice workers on relationships that had worked really well for them. We went away and we coded those interviews and we got a number of themes to tell us like what exactly was practiced in these good relationships. So how they actually do them on the ground. We then cross compared those themes with international research to make sure that what we had found out in Ireland matched the international research literature. And then we went back to the practitioners um, in the YDPs again to make sure that what we had synthesized was accurate. And then we went through a trial process, a co-design and trial process, where we worked closely with the practitioners from the 16 sites to co-design um, a good practice guide or a relationship model together and to make sure that it kind of was good on the ground, we trialed it a number of times until it was fit for purpose. So what you'll see here is my attempt at trying to make a, a graphic designed um, depiction of the relationship journey. And my boyfriend's an engineer, and last night when I was practicing this, he was like, hang on, this, is, this doesn't make sense from an engineering point of view. The foundation should be on the bottom. But anyway, hope you bear with me, and <laughs> it'll be redesigned by an actual designer by the time you get the guidance and the report. So just to say, first of all, it's really important to say that like all relationships are different and this model very much is not prescriptive. It's a relationship journey. That's what the arrow kind of represents. And it's very much taking into account like what practitioners say works, but also like the ind individual young person and the individual relationship. Just to break down the model so it's kind of a bit more clear. So the base layer, almost like a base layer of paint um, on a canvas or a wall, it acts as a foundation. 
And practitioners told us that there was one thing that was really important to do first with young people, and that was to create safety. So that meant things like creating safety between them, like emotional safety, but it also meant like a safe space, a comfortable space where they could feel secure. Just say as well that all these different things that I'm gonna be talking about in the next few minutes were based on your practice and very much on what worked really well for practitioners. So you see some quotes up there, and just to say that there'd be a lot more examples and a lot more kind of um, detail in the actual guidance and the report that you'll be getting soon. But this is a bit of a kind of like just a few little taster for what's to come. So the second thing that was really important in all relationship journeys that the practitioners told us about was this thing called, we're calling the core layer. And that's four elements that must always be present in a relationship for it to be effective. So the first two there are trust and time. And just to give an idea, like trustworthy meant be doing what you say you'll do, um, not breaking promises. And time refers to that it takes time to build a relationship with a young person. It takes time to kind of like get them to trust you and you need to invest that for an effective relationship. So the third and fourth elements that are essential are support and being young person centered. So support meant things like, you know, thinking, did the young person eat today? Do they have enough warmth? Things that kind of additional needs that they might, that, that's actually really important for relationships to be there at all. And being young person centered, starting where the young person is at, kind of thinking about, you know, their interests, their needs. And then you'll see as well on the model that there's seven skills, practices, and attributes. And this is additional to the, the, the base layer and the core layer. And these are more kind of like fluid. So basically they're really important as well, but they kind of ebb and flow and increase, decrease, depending on the relationship and depending on the time and the stage of where the relationship is at. So let's quickly run through them. The things like being fully committed, communicating with empathy, making connections and advocating, um, being flexible, practicing use of self and, and reflection, so being self-aware, being honest and, and not being afraid to challenge young people in a safe and constructive way, and then finally, guiding, inspiring hope and building agency. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Jackie now. Thanks. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, everyone. Um, I'm gonna to speak to you a little bit about our third question, and the third question asked, how can youth justice workers be supported to implement effective relationships in their work? Um, a lot of you in the room at this point will have heard of the Department of Justice um, sponsorship offer for places on the MA program in Human Rights and Criminal Justice in the University of Limerick, and the first time that offer was rolled out was in 2019 for the Action Research Project site participants. Um, of those sites, 12 of them were in a position to take up places on the program. Four sites weren't, but they were still engaged in terms of the implementation study with us. Um, and we had 16 practitioners from across those 12 sites um, participate in the master's program. And what we wanted to do at that point was to engage all of the practitioners, and I use the term practitioners to encompass early, uh, early support, family support workers and early intervention workers, as well as the youth justice workers. Um, we wanted people to engage with us to tell us about what it was like to be involved, firstly, in the action research project itself, but also the experience of trying out new stuff um, in that co-design process with us. Um, so what we did was we engaged with the practitioners on a fortnightly basis. We asked them to routinely check in with us um, to talk about the relationships. And we had kind of five core questions that we asked each time. And in that way, we recorded over about 10 months um, a series of interviews that captured kind of how the experience was going for them. And what we did then was we worked to support the practitioners to analyze their data. Um, we gave them kind of a consistent method methodology so that they, they would all use the same kind of format. So they use thematic analysis to look at all their findings and to document their findings for their studies. And those studies actually accumulated in their master's dissertation research projects. But what we did then was we took the findings from those studies and we applied them to uh, an implementation science framework. And not to bore you with the kind of science detail of it at the moment, I suppose what we did was we looked at one particular framework that kind of encompasses a lot of the, the implementation constructs, if you like. And we tried to gather a sense of or get a picture of what the experience was like. So things we looked at were 
the, the actual innovation or the intervention itself. So the relationship guidance, what was it about the relationship guidance in implementing it that was useful, not so useful, and what were the things that helped or enabled it to happen, and maybe the things that hindered or got in, away, uh, got in the way during the process. The other thing we looked at was the outer setting, the external factors. Obviously, there was things like COVID, that was huge. Every practitioner spoke about the COVID influence. But what, what were the other things like policy or communities they were based in that might have impacted how the implementation experience went for them. The third thing was the inner setting, so the organization or the project they were working in. What was it about the project or the organization that helped things to happen in terms of implementation? Uh, the fourth was around the individuals themselves and their perceptions of the intervention, if you like, and I'm calling it that, but it's the relationship guidance, essentially. Uh, how did they feel about that? And the fifth thing we looked at then was the process. What did the practitioners say in their findings about being involved in the action research process and the strategies and mechanisms that we used as a research team in terms of support? the process. So what did that look like for people? Um, I'm just going to go to two of them today because we don't have time to speak about them all, but they'll all be there comprehensively in the final report. Uh, important to say as well, I'm probably talking more to the positives here, but to, to highlight that there were challenges, as there always are with implementation, and that the practitioners are very honest as well in telling us what were the things that maybe got in the way throughout the process. Um, it's important for us to know those things as well going forward. So in terms of the actual relationship model itself, um, Sorry, there we go. Um, the photos aren't coming up for some reason, but we won't worry about that. And the evidence of the strength and quality of the actual intervention. So Caitlin mentioned the co-design process. Most of the practitioners spoke about being involved in the development of the actual guidance itself and how positive that was. Um, they spoke about it as a useful tool in terms of conscious reflection. So they used it a lot to consciously reflect on their practice, how they were doing their relationship work with young people. Um, they spoke about how it gave a good guide around what healthy professional relationships should look like um, and particularly useful for new staff coming on board as well. And they also spoke about improvements in practice. So some of the practitioners relayed where they had positives around, for example, communication with young people improving as a result of purposefully applying some of the guidelines within the, within the practice model. Um, practitioners spoke about adaptability. So um, I think Owen mentioned that it's not a set guide of instructions that you must do this within your relationship. It's more so a guideline for people around, here's what people said works really, really well. Um, and we are conscious it doesn't incorporate everything. There's still room for growth and development. But people said it was a really helpful tool because it was adaptable to what changing needs and circumstances were happening in the community or for young people in their projects at the time. And they also said it encouraged them to actually think outside the box as well because there was new ideas within it that they could develop as part of their team. Um, some of the comments that just came through the studies in relation to it, um, you'd see for yourself that it was quite positive around the kind of conscious reflection, communication with young people, being able to adapt and change and respond to challenges. And just to talk a little about the inner setting, so the organization itself, what did practitioners say about that that really supported or, or, or sometimes maybe hindered how they implemented the guidance? Um, they spoke very strongly about networks and communication. So within their projects, uh, for some practitioners, they got more structured around team meetings and events. So they found that really, really helpful in terms of setting aside purposeful time to talk about relationships with young people, both the positives and the challenges. They talked about using the tools sometimes in open um, line management or supervision sessions so that they reflected consciously on relationships and had those conversations with line management. And they talked about peer support as well, that they became more proactive in engaging with their peers to discuss relationships that they had with various young people. Um, in terms of implementation readiness or how able was the organization or the project to engage with the process at that time, uh, I've mentioned some of the barriers like COVID and different things that were happening. A big thing, a big barrier that, uh, that happened to be there for people at the time was things like staff changeover or people being redeployed because of the COVID um, scenario. And those were things that really impacted the relationship and the ability they had to actually proactively implement some of the guidance. But it's important to say that throughout this, all 16 insights stayed engaged for the entire process, which was really, really helpful um, for us. So what do we have from this? What we have from the kind of the findings of all three questions really are some kind of core recommendations that we've brought back to the advisory committee and to the Department of Justice in terms of the relationship model. Um, 
sorry, there's a few more quotes in relation to that. I'm very conscious I'm on a countdown clock here, so it's uh, stressing me out a little bit. Uh, also, the best practice development team are probably saying, wind it up. Uh, final slide. Uh, these are the kind of things that have come true in the recommendations. Again, this will all be available to you in the report as well. But first and foremost, I suppose the relationship guidance works well. That's the kind of consensus that we took from the findings. Um, and it should be disseminated and implemented across all of the projects. Um, time and space for reflection to talk about and think about relationships is really, really important. All of the projects spoke about the value in that. Um, so for us, it's about thinking around how can we support projects to have that space and time going forward as well to network and talk to each other. Organizational support is really, really key. Having an organization, an organizational climate that supports the implementation of relationships and elevates relationships to that level is really important. But also the, the Department of Justice support then to enable those organizations to offer those supports um, is really important important, excuse me. And the final one there is around ongoing learning and collaboration. And we hope that's where all of you come on board with us to, to elevate relationships even to the next level now, because we still think it's a, you know, it's a it's constantly develop, developing and evolving concept. Um, and we're, we're really interested to keep the collaborations going. Um, and just to say, we're really looking forward to working with the best practice development team to progress some of these initiatives. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Sinead, who's going to talk to you a bit more about um, the best practice development team and the initiatives they're involved in. And sorry about the time. Thanks a lot. So thank you for that, and now hand over straight away to the four members of the best practice development team. Um, can I tell Jackie not to be worried about the clock? Um, it went red twice when I was talking, and just ignore it and concentrate on the message. Go on. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jackie, Owen, and Caitlin. It was really interesting to hear about the findings, and we look forward to seeing what comes next. So most people in the room will be familiar with the Youth Diversion Programme Best Practice Development Team and the role that the team traditionally plays in the network. Um, however, there are a few new faces in the room, so we would like to take this opportunity just to introduce ourselves and speak a little bit about um, the different areas of work and how we connect to these, some of which have been already discussed this morning. So what we do. First, my name is Sinead Carolyn. As Deglon said, I am the newest member of the Best Practice Development Team. Um, so thanks very much for the, the warm welcome. And I'm joined by my colleagues Neve Skelly, Lorna Osborne Ryan, and Idel Kelly. So what do we do? Okay, so we do um, we have a role in supporting the development of the standard level of service across all YDPs nationally. And we do this through capacity building measures and practical supports. I've mentioned capacity building and we do this through um, a process, as I said, of practice development process, and capacity building is a big part of this, and my colleagues are going to speak about this in more detail shortly. We also look to the research and how this connects to practice. And we do this through consultations with REP, UL, um, the University of Ulster, and the MHS as well. Consultation with the network is really, really important, um, and we do this through surveys, communities of practice, and consultation groups. And when implementing any new practice, we follow a process of piloting and evaluating before implementation. All of the best practice development team trainings are advertised via the Funds Administration Unit in advance of the trainings, and all the trainings are run multiple times per year. I'm now going to hand you over to Neve, who's going to talk about how what we do connects to the bigger picture. Uh, thanks, Sinead, for that. Uh, you can see we're having some troubles with our presentation, so bear with us. Um, okay, so we, we've heard a lot this morning about the developments, I suppose, and the expansions um, of that are happening across the YDP network, um, with the focus on kind of family support, early intervention, harder to reach, 18 to 24. And we've also heard a lot about the relationship work that the University of Limerick have carried out as well. Sinead's also spoken about the best practice development team, and I suppose with our work, we've always tried to ensure that our work is guided by the research and evidence um, to support YDPs in their everyday work. 
Combining research, policy, strategy and practice is extremely, extremely important and allows us to ensure that we're working towards the best possible outcomes for the young people and the families that we work with as well. I suppose it's important for us to recognise and to understand how all of these elements do go hand in hand and how they do impact the direction of our everyday work. One of the places that these elements go hand in hand and that they meet is the YDP National Advisory Committee. Um, so the YDP National Advisory Committee is there really to inform the strategic direction of the YDPs. It's there to guide those capacity building measures such as best practice development team um, and rep and ensure that we're in line with the, the strategy. The National Advisory Committee is made up of representatives from the Department of Justice and Garda Siakana, from all of the community-based organisations, the rep team in Limerick and ourselves, the BPDT as well. The advisory committee really is a mechanism for collaboration. Okay, so it explores opportunities for learning, for sharing information, um, and developing that practice and ultimately trying to achieve the best possible outcomes for the young people that we work with as well. I think it's worth mentioning the role that community-based organizations have um, within this bigger picture. Um, they play a vital role in kind of allowing that research strategy and policy to be linked and to put it, be put into practice. The CBOs have created an amazing opportunity and have supported staff on the ground to really take part in all of those elements, to take part in the pilot projects, to be part of the action research project, and to give them time and space for those learning, uh, training and development opportunities as well. They've shown a fantastic, I suppose, openness and a willingness um, to engage in these kind of elements when they're already engaged in very busy uh, everyday work um, and they're put under a lot of pressure, but they still show that willingness to embrace these other elements as well. Um, as has been mentioned already this morning, uh, one of the other parts of the bigger picture is uh, the joining of REP and the Best Practice Development Team. And as Jackie mentioned, this is also something that we're really looking forward to happening um, and we're looking forward to our team expanding. Um, I think it's really needed with the expansion of all of the elements in YDPs as well. So it's really going to allow us to kind of more seamlessly support YDPs um, in implementing those strategy objectives and it's going to enable us to connect our pieces of work together. And one of the examples of how we've kind of began to do this already um, is the development of early intervention and family support. Um, and my colleague Lorna is going to discuss that in a little bit more detail. Hi everyone, thanks so much Neve. Um, so as, yeah, as we know, the Youth Justice Strategy has greatly influenced the areas of development within the YDP network, and two of which the Best Practice Development Team really got to dive into in 2022, which was of course the early intervention and family support. The Youth Justice Strategy pays particular attention to the need for effective engagement with under 12s and appropriate family supports within the communities around Ireland. When we're talking about early intervention in a YDP, we're talking about that small cohort of children aged 8 to 11 who have been identified as needing support at an early stage when problems have occurred. And when we're talking about family support, we're talking about a bit more than what we've been doing as youth justice workers in terms of linking in with families. We're really talking about those targeted interventions for families who have been identified as requiring this service based on the circumstances of the young person referred to the YDPs. And of course, as we know, providing family support to the most suitable families will in turn support the diversion work done with children and young people. And just again, and maybe a nod to the Cable Project earlier with their fantastic um, video footage and um, how much of an impact that actually has on the ground within communities. So in order to develop these areas further, the Best Practice Development Team began to gather current practices on the ground from those who were already doing this work. We then looked at best practices and other services working with 8 to 11 year olds and families and began to develop draft guidelines. These draft guidelines were then put forward for review and consultation with the YDP National Advisory Committee and the Department of Justice. The finalised guidelines were then distributed to the YDP network following approval. And of course the main aim of the guidelines is to support the work being done on the ground but also to ensure that the right young people are receiving the service in line with the strategy. Both family support and early intervention now have their own referral and consent forms, which were distributed there in October. And this allows a standard of practice in terms of referral assessment and engagement processes. 
Family support and early intervention are also now reflected within the YDP's annual plans, reports and quarterly progress templates. The Best Practice Development team have also been consulting with the REP team on their research, which is looking into the most valid assessment tools for both areas. In addition, a need for, was identified there to provide further information, resources and research in the area of early intervention. Therefore, a document was just distributed to the network again in October to support the work being done with 8 to 11 year olds. And we really understand that this is only the beginning in terms of supports for both these areas. So we really look forward to having further um, supports available within 2023. Um, and I'm conscious that the th three of us have talked a little bit about what, the, what work we've been doing, but it's now time to have a discussion around what you guys have been doing. So I know that Idel is now going to take over and uh, speak to this. Thanks so much. What we have heard already this morning, the connection to the strategy, connection to research, and that collaborative approach that we have in terms of how we work with youth diversion projects. So what I would like to do is to look at how we come to connecting all of this to your own practice. So I'd like to pose a question. And the question I would like to ask of you is, why do you do what you do? What comes just straight to your mind? From our experience as meeting you guys as practitioners on the ground, you talk about a passion for the work that you do. You talk about being advocates for the young people and the families that you work with and for standing shoulder to shoulder with those every day in your projects. And you do this with the core skill set that you bring to each and every interaction that you have on a daily basis. And to support those interactions, the best practice development team deliver core trainings to the network. And I'm just going to really briefly speak to you about those trainings. So firstly, we have the YLS CMI needs assessment tool. Um, this is a tool that's there to support us to identify the key risk need areas for focus in the lives of the young people that we work with. And they talk about dynamic risk needs. So if something is dynamic, it means that it can be changed. And when we are there to support and advocate change, build on the strengths of those that we work with and also capture their individual responsivity factors, then we are in positions to support them around sorry, recidivism and better outcomes. So combine that with work, um, working in an outcomes focused approach. This is about looking at what it is that we want to achieve by working with the young people in that age of 12 to 17 years. And one thing that we do know from our YDP practice is that there is no such thing as a straight road or a magic bullet. But in knowing what it is that we are working towards, therefore, and what it is that we want to achieve. And as Yogi Berra, any of you into intrepid mountaineering and hiking, Yogi says, well, if I don't know where I'm going, how am I going to know when I get there? And that's what this outcomes focused logic model training does. It supports us to be able to identify what it is that we hope to achieve with the young people and the families that we are working with, whilst also working with their strengths and being aware of those responsivity factors that can shape and influence our interactions with them. We also deliver motivational interviewing, and this is a collaborative conversation style that offers a framework to strengthen a person's own motivation and commitment for change. MI is an evidence-based approach that uses a process of open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarizations to explore ambivalence and enhance motivation for change. So last year, we began a national rollout of restorative practices, an approach identified within the Youth Justice Strategy for the Youth Diversion Projects, and also within the Garda Youth Diversion Program. And this approach speaks to a relational approach of working with others. It places dialogue at a premium and is often identified as a way of being. 
It informs how we think, shape, listen, engage, interact, and approach situations on a day-to-day -day basis. It gives everyone a voice, but also provides opportunities for us to hear other people's perspectives, and it can be used in any setting. Our trainings to date have highlighted the connection that many of you make in terms of your own professional identities. We deepened our understandings of why we work in such ways and connecting to the core values of restorative practice and that way of working with others. We built on this awareness by using circle practice to build connections and to enhance relationships and with an emphasis on building such practices so that when we bring people together in circles to address difficulties or challenges, that it's not so out of the norm. But we are at the very initial stages of this, building this restorative ethos, and we're going to continue to build, reflect, and um, build our capacity. So where does this leave us all? So as practitioners, as managers, as community-based organisations, members of Angartha Siakana, research, training development and government departments, we are all working towards the new beginning. We are all part of the bigger picture and we connect on so many interconnecting levels and we are all advocates for change. But on the day-to-day, -day, what you as practitioners bring the greatest resource to the YDP network is you bring yourselves. You commit to the relevant paperwork. You are open to elevating your skills and practice from an evidence-based and evidence-informed skill set. And you fine-tune your practice to build connections and relationships to bring others to a place where they become agents of their own change. We look forward to continued interaction with you over the coming year and to building on capacity and practice. Um, and thank you very much. Thanks to the four of you, and particular thanks to Adele for a demonstration of resilience and grace under pressure. I'm not sure I would have recovered. <laughs> so there isn't an opportunity for questions and answers now. We're going straight into a panel discussion that will develop some of the themes, and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after that. And on the basis of keeping to the promise uh, I made this morning that I'd be popping up and down, which you wouldn't be hearing all that much from me, I'm going to hand over straight away to Colin Mackery, who will moderate the, the panel discussion and introduce the panel members. Come. You know when you're getting old, when you have to take your glasses off to read what you've written? Um, can I, can, so it's a great to be here today in such marvellous surroundings, uh, as you'll agree. So I'm really excited about our, our next five guests. They're really experienced in youth diversion work. They are Sean Redmond, Ashin Golding, Naomi Bazio, Sue Hopkins and John Finucan. Okay, so, um, so over the next 30 minutes, we're going to speak to you on, on, on a couple of key specific areas relating, obviously, to the theme of the conference here. That includes a no wrong door concept, working to hard, with hard to reach young people, successfully working with schools and family support, and the partnership with and role of Angarda Shikonar in youth diversion projects and in the juvenile diversion programme. So I'm going to ask these beautiful people a couple of questions, maybe one or two questions based on the subject matter. And the hoping through the questions, I draw out their experiences, and you guys can take uh, some uh, key learning from, from the session. We'll take questions at the end of the five panels speaking. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. And if you identify your name and your project and who you're directing your question to at the end, that would be great. Thank you. 
So from my deliberations with the panel over the last few weeks, I know whether you're, you're new to this area of work or experience that there's something for you to take away. No pressure, lads. OK, so I'm going to start with Sean Redmond. And I think the last time we have a wee bio, to start with, Sean needs no introduction, and then we go and introduce him. So Sean is a civil servant, seconded as director of REP, a research team funded by the Department of Justice to support evidence-informed implementation of the youth justice strategy. Sean has had an association with the Youth Diversion Project since 2008, when he undertook what is referred to as the baseline report published in 2009. Sean was the lead evaluator for the Value for Money Policy Review of targeted youth programmes funded by the Department of Children and Youth Affairs in 2014. I remember all those Sean's, that tells you how old I am. <laughs> Prior to that, Sean was Assistant Director for Children's Services in Bernardo's for almost 10 years. Sean holds a doctorate in governance and is a registered social worker. So I'm delighted, Sean, you're here today to talk to us about the no wrong door concept. Will you explain the no wrong door concept to these people, please, and, and, what your, and share your vision and what you hope to get from, from the work involved in the no wrong door aspect of this work? Sure thing. Um, that's really loud, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and there's actually millions of people there as well. And when you're sitting looking this way, you don't see it. Uh, and you can see I was very careful about my selection of seats. Uh, I didn't want to take the Graham Norton tipping chair. Um, respect, Adele, respect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I've had a long association with the, uh, the uh, Guard Youth Diversion Programmes, or the Youth Diversion Programmes as they are now. And um, I just want to say one thing before we get on to the stuff around No Wrong Door, is that it's fantastic that we're here today, here today and that the Minister is so connected and the Department is so connected with the day-to-day -day practice of the uh, Youth Diversion uh, Projects. Uh, that wasn't the case when um, we first looked at the uh, Youth Diversion Projects uh, back in uh, 2008. Uh, where the practice was uh, was was kind of patchy, you know. Um, but I think that um, one of the things that kind of strikes me is that the program has a real sense of itself. Do you know, when you talk to people about, well, what's the program here for? And um, Adele asked the question uh, uh, earlier on about, you know, what is it that kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, um, motivates people to become involved in the job? I think you, there'd be a lot of homogeneity there around that. But you asked about um, No Wrong Door, uh, and I suppose the first thing to do is to kind of go to the strategy. So the strategy talks about accessible pathways for young people. So if the uh, youth diversion projects have a good sense of themselves, they are also located in context where young people have kind of present with um, uh, often kind of multiple challenges. So this idea about accessible pathways, agencies working together, this idea around collaboration uh, and a sense of kind of common purpose, you know, so that's the aspiration, I think, with uh, with um, with no wrong door. And um, what we know, I suppose, is that um, that's all very well said on paper, you know, um, but the challenge around working together becomes more and more difficult, the more complex the situations are for young people. And we see that all the time. It kind of breaks down. I suppose in practical terms, it's about agencies saying yes rather than no. Uh, and I, I, uh, Colin was saying, I, I'm a social worker by training and will have been, uh, I've done the kind of roundabout uh, with young people who may have burnt the bridges with different kind of agencies and projects uh, and having people kind of say no. And no wrong door really is about flipping that and actually the presumption saying yes, and yes, you're welcome. Um, but not only that, but also that the services that are on offer are excellent as well. So to, we've been working now with you as, uh, uh, as a huge kind of resource Based help us in our thinking around what does excellence mean, what does success mean, uh, and I think that no wrong door doesn't just mean about uh, doors opening and, and people being available, but it also means really, really excellent services as well, and it means over and above that that you know agencies are not just working together just to indulge each other, you know, so that you know a real good feel good thing about kind of working together. You know, the focus should always be um, the young person and their needs. I always think about this in kind of very practical terms, you know. If my son came home from school and said, um, you know, Dad, I've been thrown out of school. Um, I got caught with drugs in my pocket. Um, I've been stealing stuff from the local shop and I just got caught by the guards. Oh, and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm sick of you and mom and dad. Uh, I'm, sick, I'm sick of you and mom and I'm going to leave home. You know, I wouldn't take him to the bathroom to talk about the drugs issue. I wouldn't take him down into the cellar to talk about the crime issue. I wouldn't take him up into the bedroom to talk about the relationship with me and mom, uh, with, with uh, him, and, him and his mom. 
Well, that's what we do. Do you know, we do that. We kind of, um, we almost kind of de-individualize young people and, and uh, you know, and, and break them down into individual risks when really we should be thinking about how we deal with young people as a whole. And, and that's, that's, that's what we do do. So part of the challenge, I think, for No Wrong Door is to rethink about how we deal with young people presenting with very kind of complex issues uh, because they didn't ask for the way that we've actually um, decided to slice up the way our government departments work and the way that we slice up our services. So we actually owe it to them, I think, to try and break down, uh, break down uh, uh, those, those kind of barriers. The end point, though, is that um, it is that for me, no wrong door is a policy ambition in the strategy. Um, you know, uh, and I just wanted to kind of say something there around the stewardship of the program, the youth diversion program. I don't think we could be having these conversations if we didn't have really good stewardship from the top, both at the political level and also with at the policy level as well. Uh, and the fair play to seeing through some quite difficult kind of situations, but also the stewardship from the partnership with uh, individual practitioners as well, who quite evidently from the work that uh, the best practice development team and the uh, rep team have been doing in partnership with you have been looking very, very critically at practice. So I don't think we could be having these kind of conversations, which are next step conversations without having the, if you like, collective governance of, of, of the program. The straw polls that we've done are not particularly great in relation to uh, in relation to no, no wrong door. Um, it suggests that it doesn't exist. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced that there are traces of no wrong door. And our next job now over the next two to three years is to find those traces and do something similar to what we've done with the work with partnership with the projects around relationships, which is to look at those traces and to start building on the tacit knowledge and the research evidence to build up uh, uh, this idea around no wrong door over the next number of years. Sorry, Colin. Sean, I've loads of questions here. I'm sure the, pan the, the, people, the audience will, but we'll move on. I'm just conscious of time. So next up is Ashley Golden, our second panelist who's a Justice Programme Manager at the Sodus Project, a project which provides a range of innovative interventions that equip and empower young people to reach their full potential, life, live life to the full, and participate fully in society. Previously, Ashing worked for eight years in the Garda Youth Diversion Project in Dublin's North Inner City, as well as in the Boston, Boston with ROCA, an organisation focused on, on, uh, on, on youth gang members. She boasts a Master's in Youth and Community Work, as well as a Master's in Criminology, as Justice Programme Manager, Ashley supports young people who have found themselves involved in serious offending. So we're going to speak to Ashley, and she, she, she asked a question earlier around the hard to reach, so we're going to put you in the spot by asking you a question now, Ashley. Yeah. When engaging the hard to reach young people, what approaches have you found successful? Um, thank you. I um, don't recognise myself from that introduction either. I'm a youth worker. I think that's the, the best way to sum it up. Um, well, that's what you told uh, me to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's great that Hard to Reach is, is on the agenda here. When we were here three years ago, I think it was, we were all in this room, we spoke about how we were going to introduce this, and I think it's absolutely excellent that we can see that some of that has um, come to fruition, and we're here, and we're talking about it. So how do we do it? And there's a number of projects who have taken it on uh, ourselves. We are based in Dublin 8 and now in Dublin 12, and we are targeting young people who are involved in a level of offending that will be considered prolific. So certainly not just that they were caught, you know, jail old once or twice. We're talking about much more serious um, level getting into the drugs trade, gangland stuff, or just that kind of not breaking free of that poverty trap whatsoever. So there can be a little bit of a resistance sometimes, um, a reluctance within projects and one that they don't have the resources to do it, or two, that maybe that these young people are too far gone and that we're wasting our time um, chasing them. And I really want to flip that and say, absolutely not. And the projects that have been doing it are really beginning to see some of the outcomes of it. These are young people at the base. They are not um, in any way an alien or, or you know, bad to the core or anything like that. And I think everything that we've already talked about today around relationship, around that trust piece, absolutely applies in the exact same way when it comes to engaging hard to reach young people. We might just need to kind of freshen up uh, our approach with it. A huge piece that I would advocate for anybody who is interested in really trying to target some hard to reach young people is really looking at our policy of outreach. If you expect that these young people are going to, you know, get take a text from you and show up at your project next Friday night for a late night league, they won't. You know, that, that's not what's going to happen. 
we are going to have to go out and actively pursue them. That means feet on the street, going into the areas where they are hanging around, whether it's you know the parks or the flat complexes, wherever it may be, knocking on the door, expecting a level of rejection. If we're talking about young people who have probably dropped out of school, who have probably been kicked out of other youth projects or you know not on the football team and have never managed to survive in any of the other services, the idea that you will just invite them up somewhere and that that will change is not going to cut it. So we're talking about making the promise that this is what we do, this is what a, you know, a youth diversion project can offer you, being very open and honest about what your role would be, and then you go back and you go back again and you, they don't want to talk to you today, so you say, right, I'll knock up tomorrow at two. And that's what you do. You knock up tomorrow at two. You don't tell them you're going to get them a job and you're going to save their life and you're going to turn the world around. You work really slowly on building up that piece of trust. Their trust has been broken in so many other places, so we need to put the time into it. It's no magic potion. It's time, it's trust, and being ready and willing to accept that it's going to take a little bit longer and it's going to need attention and a plan from the project workers to do it. Notice there, for, there are people out here who are beginning that process of establishing a hard to reach service. Is there anything in addition to that you'd, you'd give advice or encouragement uh, in it starting out in that journey? Absolutely. Um, one would be come link in with the other projects who are already doing it. Look at this room, we're full of uh, people who are doing this work. So, you know, spend some time with other projects, kind of get a little bit of, you know, insight into what they're doing. If you can do some outreach in other areas where you're just working on that kind of building that base rather than where you have a specific task to do, that's a real help because it helps you build up that, uh, that toolkit, I suppose, that's needed. Uh, look into the work of the rec team to see what best practice is around them pieces. But again, always just keeping in mind that these are just young people and that young people want a future. And so link in and see what other resources are around you and see, can you use that? Yeah, give me a ring, no Perfect. problem. <laughs> We're going to move on to our third panellist, who is Naomi Bazio, who's a youth justice worker with the ORB project in Fibblestown. Naomi has over 20 years' experience working with young people. She holds a degree in social care practice and is a dedicated advocate for young people at risk within the Dublin 15 area. She's here today to tell us about her positive experience of working with vulnerable young people in the ORB project, with the focus being on the relationships she has developed and obtained with the local school. She has categorised the success of this work under three pillars. We're going to go discuss that with you now, Naomi. Thanks for joining us, Naomi. Do you, can you tell us how do you successfully go about engaging uh, with the local school? How did you go about doing that? Thanks, Colin. Uh, I suppose uh, for us, um, our success with engaging with our local school has been based on three pillars, like you've said. The first being how we engage with the school. So um, it's been constant with them being there to answer a phone call, being available to them, uh, attending meetings when they need. It's that very practical on the ground stuff with the school. Um, also, we found that attending with our JLOs has also helped us because it's been clear to the school and the link that we have with the JLOs and how we all work together well. Um, building strong working relationships with principals and tutors um, and, and teachers is, is great because they can ring you. It's a personal connection then as well. It also means that if a principal retires, that you still have a connection in the school, so your, your links are maintained there as well. Um, the, sec the second pillar then is how we engage with young people and their families. Um, so knowing your young people and their families well, um, knowing the families they come from, their backgrounds, for a lot of our young people, um, their backgrounds be can be quite chaotic. Um, and I suppose we can, um, we can understand that and we can bring that understanding to the school as well. I suppose the third pillar that ties the first two together and bridge the gaps is um, because of the success of the work with the school and knowing our young people and their families, um, that we are in a place then to advocate for these young people in the school um, and the school responds to this really, really well. Um, okay. so, so in terms of just starting out, anyone starting out or even looking to cement that relationship, any additional advice you'd give people around that? Yeah, um, I suppose just being, um, uh, persistent with schools. Um, I, I, what I do want to say as well, this is something that takes a long time. It, it's built up over years and years. It's not something that happens overnight. So it's, it's building and, and spending time with schools um, is, is the main, it's the key element in this. I think um, when you say, when, when the projects come in and they say they're going to do something, it's following through and doing that piece of work so the schools can see that there's results in, in the work that you'll do with them. Um, and I suppose it's just, a free-flowing communication. 
Um, I think also allowing young people to see the link that you have with the schools is a very valuable tool because young people then see that they're centre of this and they see that um, everybody's working to help um, enhance their opportunities. Because we have time, do, could you give me an example of the type yeah. of work you do with the Absolutely. young people with the schools? Um, so I suppose um, on the project at the moment, um, I'm going to use an example of Sarah. She's 15 years old, um, Irish born to Eastern European parents. Um, dad's not around and mom's an alcoholic. Um, there's a history of domestic violence in the family. Uh, Sarah is heavily involved in antisocial behaviour behavior and um, engages in, um, engages in uh, substance misuse. She also has a physical disability. Uh, Sarah was cautioned uh, by the JLO, for instance, of public order, assault and theft. Um, she's now in fifth year, um, and what I will say, I suppose one of her protective factors is this, that she likes to go to school. She gets up every day and gets herself ready and goes to school. However, uh, Sarah found herself um, in a position where she was suspended for three days for fighting in school. Um, and pending her three days, she would need to come back into school with her mum for a meeting. Um, three days rolled into three weeks and Sarah still hadn't returned to school. Mum had been involved in an incident um, uh, she was assaulted and was hospitalised, so couldn't attend the school. However, the school had very little um, engagement with Mam in the past anyway. The project stepped in and uh, we were able to advocate for this young person. We were able to fill in the gaps for the school. We went to the meeting with the young person and she returned to school. She's still now in school and working towards our Leaving Cert. Okay, super. That leads on to our, our, our fourth panellist, Sue. How do you do? How okay. do you do? <laughs> Sue is, a, is, a, is the team leader of the Cross Care Family Support Service and has been working with individual <clears throat> families and communities for over 32 years, starting out as a volunteer in a local community. She received a scholarship from NUI Maynooth to study community development and went on to study addiction studies and counselling. She's worked as a drugs worker, counsellor and tutor in drugs projects as well as in prisons and as a team leader and manager of HSE community drugs teams and community development projects. In 2004, she undertook research in antisocial behaviour in the North Clondalkin area and also designed the Family Support Programme funded since 2005 and managed by Crosscare since 2013. In 2020, Sue became team leader of the growing Family Support Service that I think I'm correct in saying now boasts family, seven family support yeah. staff. Okay, <clears throat> brilliant. So tell me a little bit more about the growing serving that is the Crosscare Family Support Service. Yeah, well, the, with the, with the Cross Care Family Support Service, as, as I was saying there, started out in Ronstown Youth Service in 2004, following a piece of research there. And it's just grown from there in, in momentum and over the years. And then in 2020, we received funding from Chulslet as well for two family support workers to workers in Ronstown. And at the time of that, it was very much about going into them and presenting the model we were using, the youth diversion model of working with families. And they were happy to take that on board. And since then, now we have, um, we now have family support workers covering Luke and Clondalk and Ballymun, Swords, Finglas, Dundrum, Dunleary, Ballyorgan, Lachlanstown. So we've quite a big spread of an area. So it's an unusual team in a sense that we're all based in different um, locations. Okay, super. Okay, um, and tell me this: when we, we did in preparation for, for for today, we you talked incredibly well about the role that the Gardaí play in the project and the and the partnership. Can you just detail what that work looks like? Yeah, well, I think in uh, up in Ronan's town in uh, Clondalkin, we have a unique rela relationship with with the guards, and a lot of people talk about family support work and linking them with the youth justice workers and the JLO and. We've found over the years that um, because of the relationship we have, it would not only be with the JLO, but would be with the whole uh, Compal team as well, our lo local team of the community police, the sergeant, the inspector. And that's a very tight relationship that has been built up over the years on both sides. And it's a crucial part of it because I feel when the families come into us, no matter what service it is around Dublin or anywhere around the country, they're, they're so vulnerable and they're really coming from a place of fear and they're not really present. They're so detached from what's going on. So I feel by if we're building like a safety net around them, that if we have that key team of the youth justice worker, the family support worker, the JLO, the community guards, that we've everybody on board and sometimes bringing in other services as well then, that we can really work with a holistic pro approach to look at all the issues that the family are facing. I think it's probably one of the very unique projects. I'm sure there are other projects here where there are a range of funders coming together to collaborate, to work together, yeah. to add value. So I, I, I'm sure there's going to be loads of questions around that. 
Um, just when we were talking, you were talking about the actual work of family support, and you mentioned to me during the week about that peer support group, the actual practical work that they do on the ground with families and parents. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that, please? Yeah, um, we do. So what we do, and we work with a family, and we work with them maybe for the first eight to ten weeks, and initially are really working from a model of person development with the parents, and by doing that with the parents, then you're kind of building their self-esteem and their self-sufficiency, and that then models very positive behaviour for the young person, the family. So the next layer of that then would be bringing some of the parents together for peer support. Um, and one comment I had a, a while ago from one woman which said it all, she said, um, a mother said, I just want to be visible. So she's felt really invisible in the whole thing. And by being with other people that are experience, experiencing the same issues is very, very powerful. And it just really, and it's, it's gone on over the years that people that have been through it and they use their experience then to put it back into the community with other mothers. And that's then an impact not just on that family but on the whole community as well. So it would be at the stage now that we're there, particularly in Rowanstown that long, that we'd have self-referrals, that people would knock up to the door looking for one of the family support workers that they're, they're in trouble. Because of um, the relationship we have with the guards, a lot of our families would know the community guard, the community police by, by their first name. So if there is an issue, um, like recently there, one of my last cases was, um, one of my clients was badly assaulted one morning. She was due in court against another family mom member. So the first phone call was, was a serious assault. So my first call was, I knew who was on that day, so I knew to, who to ring in um, the comp hall team. I knew the sergeant was there, I rang him. Um, then I'd bring the family into court. Then it was communication with the sergeant and the two community police that were on that day around creating a safety plan for when we went home because I knew the person that had assaulted the person had been out using and drinking and I knew they'd probably come back around for more. So it was about supporting the family, bringing, bringing them home. That morning, actually, when I went to the house, that young person, a lot of very young people experienced trauma and really serious crime. Um, unfortunately, some of our young people have witnessed their parents being beaten up in front of them to the extent where we had some young children that actually had their rope being gruesome, parents' blood on them from being part of the attack. So this young person would be very used to, to violence and, and, you know, people coming in assaulting the parents. So when I went to the house that morning to bring them to court, and the 12 year old was in the hall with an axe and I couldn't, I had to literally spend a few minutes calming him down to prise the axe off him because he thought someone was coming in to kill his mother. So it was about on the way back, communicating all the way home with, with the community police. Um, and when we got home then, that two of the Compal team were there that I know well and that the family know well. We spoke through a little plan. They went around to the family around the corner. The neighbour had attacked this lady. I'd done the emotional support piece with the mother and with the young person and a bit of a debriefing, debriefing piece with them. Then the community police came back on myself. It was about removing things. I was looking at what, what they could harm themselves or others with in the house. So it was about removing the axe, removing, the, removing things that they could um, as it was explained to them with knife crime, if they're going to be carrying something or have something ready to go, they could be the ones that get hurt in the end. So it was a whole piece over a day. And then because of the relationship we have as well, following that case when I was on my way home, it was me getting a phone call from one of, one of, them, one of the, the Compal uh, workers saying, you know, how are you? Just checking in, are you OK? So we, we would have that really good relationship and that's been built up on both sides over years. And that's what we're trying to build and bring out to all the other communities that we work in through the family support teams. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's a really concrete example of the, the family support work in action and how it links and integrates with the Garda Youth Diversion Project and all the elements that we've discussed here and, and our other speakers today. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Sue. So we move on to John Finucan. Superintendent John Finucan has 20 years service in Angarda Shikana. He served in Pier Street Garda Station, Garda Headquarters and the Garda National Economic Crime Bureau. His current role is as Director of the Diversion Programme. He has been in the role for approximately two years. So on behalf of the Garda Commissioner, John holds a statutory function for considering the suitability for inclusion of every child referred to the diversion programme. John, you're very welcome. Thank you. I've always liked to get a superintendent to quiz them up on stage in front of two or three hundred people, so yeah, I'll go yeah. easy on you today. <laughs> okay. you know. John, can you tell me about your role in the implementation of the, the diversion programme, please? Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Nice to see so many people here today. 
when I was thinking about what to say today, I, I suppose what it comes down to the difference is you, and that might that may seem you know an easy thing to say. I have 27, nearly 28 years service in a Garda Shikana. My first seven years was in Bray in County Wicklow, which is a provincial town with kind of a rural and urban background to it. And I just I tell you this story just for context, but. Every Friday at the time there was court, and as a young guard, you'd be out trying to get prosecutions and trying to, you know, uh, deal with crime. And at the end of court every Friday, the judge would sign the warrant, <laughs> and you'd head off into town, into, in, into Mountjoy Prison, or to Oberstown maybe, and you'd drop the prisoners in, and you'd, you'd literally drop them to the, to the door. <laughs> and the big thing that struck me and it, is how lucky I was to have a decent upbringing, someone who corrected me and kept me on the right path. And the sad thing is about prisons, prisons are really sad places. They're, they're sad places, there's a loss of hope, but there's also a loss of a family member to provide support. But we do need a justice system, there has to be some sort of punishment. But most people are there because of their circumstances. And, that, and that's a fact, that they've come through a system which has guided them towards that. Yes, the person who commits a heinous crime needs to be punished, but actually if we, if we can stop that and divert people away from that, we've succeeded. We recently had a JLO conference in May and we had a JLO training recently. And some of the facts and figures I keep saying to the JLOs are, and I don't want to go too heavy on this, it costs about 80,000 euros a year to keep a prisoner in, in jail. That's a lot of money, but more than that, it's a lot of opportunity lost. If that person isn't contributing to the society, he's actually a draw, we're paying for those places. So if I bring that back to my role, I know I'm the superintendent in charge of the diversion program, but actually when you think about it, what it's all about is a direction. It's providing direction to young people. And most of us probably when we were growing up, or we weren't allowed to things because our parents didn't want us. But what were they doing? They were providing us with, with direction. So in terms of an overview where we are now, our, our bureau gets about 15,000 referrals a year. That refers to in or around 10,000 children, roughly speaking. So obviously we have to look at them each morning and decide what's gonna happen. So we obviously work through the system then on how, how, how are they gonna work? How are we gonna deal with that? About 75% of them are dealt with through kind of informal cautions or informal cautions. And they're people who respond to the guard calling out and calling their parents in, telling them that this behavior is unacceptable. The challenging area for us then is, is probably in the next 25%. And these are people who keep touching off the criminal justice system. They keep getting into trouble for various, right away from public order, theft, sexual offenses. And they come into us, and myself and the two inspectors that are here today, Dan and Aidan, we have the decision under the act whether that child will go to court or whether that child, or whether that child will go into the diversion program. And I'm hugely dependent on the likes of the JLO officers. I'm delighted to see so many guards here today. But I'm also massively dependent on what services we can provide to those young people. And that's where you come in. Because the projects provide a structure for young people, and that's what they're lacking in their life. Often they're missing just that vital thing. And what you don't realize is, there is, and this is what touches off, you know, no wrong to our one good person. They're awfully, often only struggling for someone to, someone to provide a little bit of guidance to them. Somebody pro to provide them with a structure on their life in what can be a chaotic home situation. We prepare a thing called a suitability report. And the suitability report is prepared by the JLOs and they go out and they meet the family and the child and they report back into us and they tell, them, they tell me and they tell the two lads what's happened at home and what the scenario is. And we have some very tough decisions to make at times, whether we should send a, court, a child into the, into the judicial system towards court, or whether we can guide them away from that. And that's where the, the projects are so important, because you're providing structure. And often you'll find that children are difficult, particularly when they're, where they're, they're, I suppose, struggling in the early part of life. If you think about it, when all of us were young, we didn't have as many mobile phones, probably weren't, or in my case anyway, mobile phones weren't a bigger thing. You know, there wasn't as many outfight influences. It's hard sometimes to stay in the straight and narrow, not to be influenced by particular attractions that may bring it towards criminality. But the projects provide a structure for children. They provide an outlet for children. But more and more, they provide it somewhere where can guard Shikana can work with, somewhere to guide them away from the, from the criminal justice system. So in that regard, I have to say thank you. We are, we are highly indebted to what you do. I would say to you, it's, it's very much, if you're a superintendent, a superintendent in a provincial town or anywhere, you're trying to manage crime, you're trying to make sure that people are safe, that's the mission of Angarda Shikana. So in doing that, we have a community policing team in every area, we have a juvenile liaison officer in every area. Please check in with them. Please make sure they get involved with your, your particular projects because they're very keen to get involved. And if they're not, you can talk to our office, we'll get people that, we'll find your local contact. 
In, in terms of, of, of uh, disclosures, when we get one in every day and we look at it, we, we have to make that decision fairly quickly. The more serious offences, then we, we look for a report on. And often, sometimes, I actually pick up the phone, or the two lads do, and they'll ring the local JLO officer and they'll ask, you know, what's happening here? You know, and they, often they'll tell us, there's a diversion project there that I have in mind for this fella. This guy's gone on this gun, you know, he's gone slightly wrong or he needs a bit of structure, and that's what you're providing. And, and I finish with this particular story. Uh, one of my roles is to, is to interview for, for JLO officers to, to, to pick them to be that particular role. And I was interviewing one and I was talking to the retiring JLO officer and he was telling me that um, he dealt with a child all through the teens, particularly difficult. And he never, he always struggled to keep him on the straight and narrow. It wasn't until that, that child was 28 years of age that he came back to him and said, you know what, I now realize what you did for me. I'm now proud that I have a job. I'm now proud that I'm a father and I see the problems. So I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. Keep up the good work. And certainly from a Gary Shikona's point of view, our, our structure and our role is to keep people safe, and you play a key role in that. Thank you. Brilliant, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we really wanted the opportunity to open this up to, to you guys. Um, so there's people going around with roving mics there. If you, decide, if you just introduce who you are, from what project, and who you're going to direct your question to. So, the brilliant five panellists, I'm sure people have loads of questions, so if we start with anyone that particularly want to begin. Have a chat with somebody beside you, and in one minute we'll get you to, to ask a question from your table. Is that okay? Sorry, we have somebody with good man. We'll start down here on the left hand John, side, please. John. Um, John Clark from the Valley Project in Round Sound Crosscar. Ashling, put you on the spot. Right. <laughs> this new harder to reach. Um, it's great. Now, we always ask about the relationship. We feel that we're bridging the gap between young people and the guards. What problems do you think you're going to face with the uh, harder to reach ones that you mentioned were up to our necks in it? Um, I, I think one of the biggest problems is that the young people will continue to be involved in offending, and in some cases quite serious offending, while the intervention is taking place. And sometimes it can be very hard to even justify to members of Angada Shilkana or just to the community uh, why we're standing beside them and why we're putting all this effort in when they're causing so much, sometimes, destruction in the community where they're living. And that's a big challenge because we, we've definitely found it, that we've, we've met that wall a couple of times. And it's particularly hard when you meet it from people in the community saying, you know, why are these young people getting your attention? What about the good kids, you know? Um, we really need to be very clear about what our job is to do, and that's why the harder to reach work being involved with, within YDPs and within other existing new services like UBU and stuff where there's services for other young people is also really important because it means it's not that it's just the, the really bold kids getting it, you know? So I think us being really clear on every young person needs a chance. And actually, if we don't intervene with these young people and we don't try to change their lives for the better of them, but obviously for the better of society as well, that actually the problems in the community will only get worse. So we have to defend the work that we do by a young person needs a chance and needs an opportunity, but looking at it from the, the wider benefits that it brings to, to the community when people do uh, divert out of this type of work. But it's, you, you get, like you definitely get a bit of, they don't deserve it. And I think that really takes for everybody who's involved in it, from the back end of the department to the back end of the research to say, this is worthwhile for everybody. This is worthwhile for the young person, but it's worthwhile for absolutely everybody in the community too. And that's what we have to stand for as youth workers, that that's what we are there to do. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Have we anyone else for a question or a comment on anything you've heard? No? Okay, we're not. So, smell the spuds. So, uh, I'm conscious of time, we're going to wrap up. Actually, we're probably one of the first groups that are ahead of schedule, so we'll just thank you, the panel, for being brief, but sharing their, their, their wonderful stories.
Uh, I'd like to thank Sean, Ashley, Naomi, Sue, and John for, the, for sharing their experience and stories, and to you, the audience, for your attention and participation. And can we have a round of, uh, of applause for this fantastic panel? John, thank you. And thank you, Colin, for moderating that session. And we're getting off very easy on the questions. Uh, obviously, everybody, everything is terribly clear and everybody is very happy. So maybe after you've had your lunch, there might be a few more questions. So for the next session, um, it's back to yourselves to hear what the projects are doing, to hear your voice. Uh, we have a presentation from Thro Nua YDP, Sylvia Grichuk, uh, is the Troa NUA project coordinator. Sylvie has been working in the project since 2012. She's joined by Maria Courtney, who's a youth justice worker who's with the project since 2018, and Elaine Tanian, who's a duty social worker in the social work department in Chewham since 2015. Um, so you're very welcome, and I now hand over to uh, Troa NUA, who are going to talk to us about the work that they do.